in the Lord's Prayer, there's a piece in there, this line that Jesus gives, and he says, uh, Father, you're, this, in other words, he's saying this is how we should pray. Uh, we should pray, you know, um, you know, your will be done, right? On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you are currently on earth? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Help me out here. Some people aren't raising their hands. Some of you are not on earth. There's some space cadets. There we are. It says you're praying that things would be on earth as it is in heaven. All right, so when you quoted that passage, me knowing what it is that the Lord laid out for me to speak today, I thought about that. It's profound because he says, in my father's house there are many mansions and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Amen. And you think about that. This is, he's preparing a place that we're going to walk into. And he uses the language that we interpret as mansions. And you made a statement, brother, and I might as well turn the mic over to you <laughs> this morning. But you made a statement of when we look around the earth, the places that man has not touched and destroyed, because we destroy things as much as we try to make it better. When you look at those areas that it's just the hand of God, we see the beauty. Of what God has done. And then you made a statement. He's preparing a mansion for us. Like with his hands. Like a home for us. With his hands. And and, and as you said that. It, it blew my mind. Because I'm thinking. We can't imagine what that is. And when we drive. Uh, you know from Knoxville. To you know Elizabethtown. Kentucky. Or if we're dri driving from Knoxville to Nashville or wherever, there are some nice houses in nice neighborhoods. I mean, there are beautiful houses, big and fancy. And, you know, my wife always says, look at how well they keep their lawn. It's beautiful. But the hand of God somehow creates something even more dynamic. And it's a promise that he has for us that we will inherit that I sat in a classroom this week we were talking and we're going through the the gospels with, with my students and one of my students we were talking about we were in John chapter 3 and one of my students we were talking about born, being born again eternal life and I had the kids give discussion and I heard overheard one of the students in a discussion say to their group said I don't think we understand what this eternal life is and like I heard I heard the little girl say that and I let them have their little conversation. And then we were done. I asked her, hey, would you say that again out loud for the rest of us? And she said, oh, well, I, it was, I think it's stupid. I don't want to say it. I said, no, no, say it. She said, I don't really think we understand what eternal life is. I said, bingo. Like, we don't. We really don't. We have a concept of time, right? The service here starts at 1045. Sunday school starts at 9.45. I have a timer that keeps me on time so I don't ramble on. <laughs> so the, I know that I've got about 30 minutes, and then at some point my alarm's going to say, all right, it's time, you're, you're done, wind it down. People have things to do. You know, we know it takes about four hours to get from here to our doorstep. I know what time I have to get to school uh, to start teaching. I know what time my first period ends. I know what, you know, we have this idea of time. We have an idea of a birthday, right? And then, for those of you who have lost loved ones, you have an idea of an end date here on earth. Like, like we have, and we've got the dash, and there's a lot of information in the dash, but we function in time. But Jesus promises us eternal life. And we sit here and think, what could that possibly be? Like he's preparing a mansion for us, which is greater than we could ever think. That's right. He's he's allowed us access to eternal life, starting the moment. Well, eternal life with Him, starting the moment we accepted Him as as Lord and Savior. That's right. And you prayed in your prayer, we're going to spend eternity eternity somewhere. 
Well, well you got the choice. I, if I were you, I'd choose the better place. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Which your wives have done. Right? And they're enjoying that. But we don't have a concept of eternity. But Jesus says when you pray, you pray, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to work through a little bit of that. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn to your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25. Uh, Lord, would you uh, speak through me today? Lord, would you meet your people today? God, would you uh, make residence in our hearts today? I know your spirit is here. Lord, from the moment that I stepped foot in this building, from the moment that I heard the conversations, and even with the struggle of computer and technology, you are right in the midst. So God, would you open your word to us? May it change us. May it enlighten us. May it remind us of who we are in you. And even more than that, who you are in eternity. Father, speak through me today. I pray in Jesus' name. Uh, Exodus 25 is where I'm going to ask you to go. We're actually going to work through this idea today. And I'm going to hopefully just read through scripture and maybe exposit a little bit. Where we ended off last time I was here, about a month ago, we ended in Exodus chapter 23. And if you remember, which there's not a test, but if you remember, we kind of said that God is bringing us somewhere. And we talked about the children of Israel and this journey to Canaan land. He brings them to the mountain to worship. But he says, that's not the, the stopping place. We're going we're gonna to teach you and reteach you some things. And then you're going to go to this promised land. And the Bible in Exodus chapter 23 shows us God saying, I'm going to give you the land, but I'm not going to give it all at once. I'm going to give it incrementally because if you get it all at once, you'll mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> It'll overtake you. And he says, I'm, I'm going to allow you victories little by little by little until you achieve what I'm asking you to achieve or what I, I promised for you to achieve. Um, he ends the, uh, what we have as chapter 23 with these two. Don't turn to so I'm just going to read it. Verse 32 says, when you get there, you shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest you make sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. You're going to take over the land, I'm going to give it to you, but don't get mixed up in the things that... They worship. Because if you do, it's going to be a snare to you. It's, it's going to hinder you. It's going to mess you up. God says, I'm putting aside a people for myself. A people that are called by my name. A people through whom I'm going to reveal who I am to the earth. And so I need you to be separate. This is not an issue of Prejudice, this is not an issue of discrimination. This is an issue of holiness. That's right. This is God saying, I, I, I don't want to risk you getting mixed up with the things that the world around you, the cultures around you, get mixed up in. I need you to understand, I am your God, and you need to be set aside, holy, sanctified, for that purpose. So, don't get mixed up with the people and things that you see. Understand, I have set you apart. Exodus 24, he then takes Moses up into the mountain and, and spends some time uh, kind of securing this. There's some sacrifices that are, that are given. He's, he's, he's um, solidifying this covenant. You see the cloud come down over the mountain, engulf the mountain. You see fire coming down, engulfing the mountain. Moses is up there, the Bible says, for 40 days and 40 nights, just hearing the word of God. And then we get to chapter 25. And there's this interesting passage here. And this is what we're going to read. The Lord then said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him. You shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, fine twined linen, goat's hair, 
tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant is, uh, incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the uh, breast piece. I'll pause. I pause at verse 7. God says to Moses, I want you to tell the people to collect this stuff. And here's what's interesting and kind of my first uh, point. God says, I would like you to be invested in this. I'm doing something, I'm about to do something, and I need you to be invested. And he doesn't twist his arms. He said, I want you to get this from anyone who's willing. Right? ESV says uh, those who, whose hearts moves them. Um, those who are volunteering. Those who are saying, yeah, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of what God is doing. God says, get all these things. And here's what's interesting. And I got to think, God says through Moses... Tell your people, tell the people to give me, just collect all these things. And the people have no clue at this point why. When he goes down the mountain, he says, all right, bring me your gold, your silver, your, your acacia, we'll just, just donate it. I can imagine, they're like, why? This is random. Why are you collecting these things? They have no clue what's going on. What's about to happen is God is going to have them construct something on earth as it is in heaven. They have no idea. But he says, if you're willing, bring me these things. Bring me these things. Right? Verse 8. And let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. If I'm Moses... And I'm on a mountain engulfed in cloud and fire and thunder from what we understand when the voice of God speaks. It's like thunder to the degree that the people said, we're not going up there, Moses. You go. You just tell us what he said. Because we're afraid. And God says, hey, I would like you to build for me a sanctuary so that I may dwell in your midst. That blows my mind. That blows my mind. Um, so I figure I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down some of these words. Uh, I'm not sure. Did you get my email this morning? Did you get it in there? Yeah. Is that what this is? Yes. Oh, could you go to the next? Is the slide with the words on there? No. No, got it. Computer problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got the board. <laughs> I was ready. I'm just curious. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to write some words down here. All right. God says this. He says, I would like you to build a temple for me. Uh, when I just look up, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. This would have been Hebrew words. I just looked, I looked it up in what we have as a Hebrew dictionary. I'd like you to build a sanctuary for me. That word here, I don't know if you can even see it. I'm going to try to write it really big. I should ask my girls to write it. They write it much neater than I am. Mikdash. Meaning a consecrated thing or a consecrated place. It says, I'd like you to build a mikdash, a consecrated thing or a consecrated place. I'd like you to build that. All these things that you've collected is because you're going to build a consecrated place, a consecrated thing for me. They have no clue. They have no idea what's... What? In fact, right now, Moses is just getting the instructions. He says, I'd like you to build a mikdash for me to, I'm going to write this down. Shachan, for me to dwell. Shachan. Dwell means simply to lodge, to permanently stay. We, we uh, traveled out to Elizabethtown yesterday. We found a hotel. We lodged. We settled. We, we, we rested. Shacham. I'd like you to build a consecrated place where I'm going to rest. I'm going to settle down. Would you build this for me, he says. That's... 
It's interesting. Um, verse 9. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make. And then he uses that word tabernacle. And that word tabernacle is basically a combination of these words. Um, there's a uh, church in our district, Spanish uh, primarily church, Mishkan. Um, Iglesia Mishkan. That word... Mishkan is basically a combination of these, Mikdash, Shachan, a, 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 a consecrated place for dwelling. God says, I would like you to build a consecrated place for me to rest in, and I am going to give you the pattern or the model. I'm going to stretch you how to make this Mishkan, this, this tabernacle. Remember, I would like to see your kingdom come on earth as it is where? In heaven. In heaven. He says, I, I, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle, that's what I want you to do. I have never even pretended to be a construction worker. I can't build things. If I get things from Ikea, I they fall apart. <laughs> I, I just, I like, and, and I, tell me I'm right. Well, you know I'm right. I'd rather uh, shop from a thrift store, not because it's cheaper, but because it's already put together. <laughs> right? But if, if you get me something new, and I look at it, and it's in a flat box, and I got to create it, I'm like, no, let's just go to a thrift store where someone else has put it together, and I'll just put it up. Because I just don't build. However, God has blessed me in that I've had a bunch of friends, or I've been through a bunch of situations where people have built things. Uh, I've worked in retail stores where we did remodeling uh, of, of pretty big stores, or we've opened new stores, and construction companies came and they built you know, the, the template, they put the walls up, I've seen that. Uh, churches, we, we remodeled first was in Nashville. Um, there's other churches that I've been a part of where we've done renovation projects. I have friends who are in construction, they build. I uh, lived in New York City and in Nashville where they're just putting up skyscrapers and you walk back and forth and you see the, the ditch that's built and you see the, you know, the foundation. One thing that I've learned is that when you build something that you want to last for a while, there's some sort of template, there's some sort of architectural rendering, there's some sort of drawing, there's some sort of plan that someone looks at it and says, okay, here's where we're going to put the wall. Here's where the bearing wall is going to be. Here's where this is. It. We need this in order to put the shingles. We need this size or weight of wood or whatever. Anybody who builds it, am I kind of right? There's, yeah. like, we don't just randomly walk up with some wood and just start putting it in the ground and just, no, there's some sort of a plan. And the, whoever drew the, or the renderings, whoever the architect was, whoever the engineer was, has some, you've got measurements, you've got angles, you, you, you've got the, you know what you've got to do to pull the right permits, to run the right electric, like there is a plan for what you're trying to do. I had a friend, um, not even a, 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 I think it was a family who went to the Nashville church, and a member of their family was building a plane. Hmm. And I, I went to, I remember going to their house, and he brings me into his garage, and he says, I'm building a plane. And he's got a wing up there, like that's all that was there, was like a wing. I'm like, you're building a plane? He said, yeah, these are the plans. And that book of plans was like that thick. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> that thick. But it's all the plans. I mean, I guess if you're gonna put something in the sky and have people on it, you better have some plans, <laughs> yeah. a lot of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And this is probably four or five years ago. If he's further along, I would ex suspect that if I turned to a page in those plans, it would match up with what I see. Yeah. God says, I want you to build something, and I'm going to give you the plans. Like I, It's according to this pattern. I'm telling you what you need to use, and I'm going to tell you how you're going to construct it. I need it to be on earth as it is, as in, heaven. As it is in heaven. There is something going on in earth that this tabernacle represent that we simply try to come somewhere close to it here on earth as it is in heaven. 
When we come and we worship and you sing songs or you bring a special selection or, you know, we encourage one another, we give testimony, I got to believe that something that we're doing here must model something that's in heaven. That's something that we're, we're expecting to be recreated on earth as it is in heaven. God says, I want you to gather these things and I need it to be on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, do you, by any chance, have that next slide of the ark? I'm going to read through. This is verse 10, chapter 25. They shall, this is God's instruction, they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half is its breadth, and a cubit and a half its light, uh, excuse me, its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside. You shall overlay it. You shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cause four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet two rings on the one side of it, two rings on the other side of it. The reason I have this picture, because this is someone's rendering of what that probably looked like. Verse 13. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You should put, put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. You shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you, his commandments, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Verse 19, make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall, shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. I'm going to pause at verse 19. The mercy seat is basically the lid. How are we going to close it up? We're going to put a lid on it. But I want you to construct these cherubim. And each cherub should be on either side with wings, it says, that are going to cross across this ark. I looked up cherub. What is a, what is a cherub? We don't have an idea of what a cherub is. Like, we don't have an idea of what eternal life is. Like, we... we, we we try to imagine what it is, but we don't have an idea, a true idea of what a cherub is. We think of a cherub as an angel. And when I was looking for uh, pictures to maybe put up there, a lot of them were female looking cherub with wings. Uh, but that's probably not what it is. Um, you get a bunch of them that look like little babies with wings, but that's Probably not what it is. I'm going to read just really quickly um, out of the Keyword Study Bible. There's just a little kind of a commentary note under the word for cherub. Here's what it says. It's a masculine noun of uncertain derivation meaning an angelic being. So if you see a cherub depicted as a female, it's probably not in keeping with the word because the word says it's a masculine noun. So somehow the angels were masculine. Uh, it's commonly uh, translated as cherub. The Bible provides scant details concerning the likeness of these winged creatures, except for the apocalyptic visions of Ezekiel in Ezekiel 10. However, current pictures of cherub as chubby infants with wings or as feminine creatures find no scriptural basis. I agree. The Bible portrays cherubim as the guardians of the Garden of Eagle, uh, Eden. I'll be honest with you. Some little baby with a wing guarding the, guarding the Garden of Eden. I'm like, I'm gonna, I, I can take him. The, the cherub were guardians of the Garden of Eden, saying you can't get in here. They're seemingly the glory of the, of the Lord. They are flanking the throne of God. Um, uh, through, uh, though these may be poetic references to the mercy seat in the tabernacle, they are embroidered images on the tapestry of the tabernacle. They're sculpted images arching above the mercy seat of the ark. Interestingly enough, Satan is described as being the anointed cherub before he was cast out of heaven. So this idea of cherub is not a gentle, polite, these are guardians. When you think of angels that ushered Lot out and rescued Lot, they were fierce. 
So I think about this mercy seat, which will lead probably next month when I get back here. We'll talk about how that was used. Literally, sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice would be sprinkled on that mercy seat. And these, and, and inside of it, when he said the testimony, that, that's the word of God, which is housed in this thing. So the word of God is planted in that ark, and it's covered symbolically by this cherub, the most powerful creatures probably in the heavenly. This is what we make. But God is making on earth as it is in heaven. Let me see if I can finish this. Uh, verse 20. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall, shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. There, verse 22, I will meet with you. And from, the, from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in the commandment for the people of Israel. So God said, this is ark that you're going to create on earth as it is in heaven. And you're going to put my word inside of it on earth as it is in heaven. And then angels are going to protect that on earth as it is in heaven. And I am going to meet with you there. And I am going to speak with you there. And I am going to confirm my word with you there. On earth as it is in heaven. And then what he does is after he puts in the, he gives a description for a little bit more furniture. And you can go back to that tabernacle picture. And then, and we won't do this, we'll, do, we'll finish this next uh, time I'm here. But then he says, construct this tabernacle. And he gives this model for this tabernacle. And you know where that ark goes. That ark doesn't go out here in the court. It doesn't even go in here in the holy place. Holy of holies. It goes here in the, the holy of holies. The most holy place. That's where it goes. Where only the priest can show up once a year to offer a sacrifice on behalf of the people. The most holiest of holies has this ark with God's word protected by God's angels, where God says, I'm going to meet with you in the holiest of holies. Like I said, next week we'll look at the tabernacle a little bit closer, but if you can real quick, turn to Hebrews chapter 8. And since we're not operating in eternity, we've got time. <laughs> I'm going to read a little bit of Hebrews chapter 8 for you. Verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of, majest of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy place, in the true tent that the Lord set up. Not man. For every high priest is, a, is appointed to offer gifts uh, and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer on, on, on his own behalf. Right? Now, if he were on earth, the majesty, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve, verse 5, a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry as that that is much more excellent than the old as, uh, than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises for if that first covenant had been faultless there would have been no occasion to look for a second and just in the interest of time I'm going to jump down to verse 10 for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days declares the Lord I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. If we fast forward from this to today, that temple is us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
But if we fast forward from this moment here to, the, to eternity, yeah. There is a temple where God dwells, where he's meeting with his people in heaven that we, are, we just have a type, a pattern. Nevertheless, God says this, I want to dwell with my people. So in order for God to do that, you know what he requires? He requires us to be called out ones. That process of sanctification, that process of, of holiness. If we're going to achieve on earth as it is in heaven, what he says is, I need a people who are called out, who are set apart, who are mikdash, consecrated ones. Conse our bodies are consecrated places. What's as interesting as here is, Listen, if, if this stopped being a church and it became a dollar store, it would just be a dollar store. That's right. But when the people of God show up, it becomes a sanctuary. That's right. It becomes a sanctuary. When they collect the acacia wood, there's probably nothing special about the wood. When they collect the gold, there's probably nothing special about the gold. But the moment God says... I'm going to show up there. And it's holy. It's holy. And here's what God does for us. And we'll close on this thought. We're all, we're all special. Like we, we are. You're special. Don't hear, don't say that, you know, we go home saying the pastor said I'm not special. No, you're all special. But we're human. Like humans are ordinary. We're not cherubim. We're not... You know, if, if I tried to guard the Garden of Eden, I mean, someone could run a football, knock me down. I'm, there's nothing about me in and of myself. But the moment my body is set apart and it's a temple of the Holy Spirit where he dwells, there's something that's different about me. And when you allow your life to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, a place where God dwells. There's something amazing about you. That's why uh, when we don't forgive ourselves, who do we think we are? If the God of the universe says you're forgiven, he's the one that's dwelling. We are called to be sanctified. What does that mean? That means we're set apart. We are consecrated. We are no longer our own. We were bought at a price. Because God said, I want a people who are set aside as holy, who will embody my word, and I will protect them. I will meet with them, and I will confirm my word through them. Next time I'm here, we will finish with the tabernacle. We will continue in uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll see how this all comes together and helps to fuel our worship. Would you stand together with me? I'm going to pray, and, and, and I'm going to tell you right now what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray on our behalf that we would always avail ourselves, our lives, to be indwelt by his spirit, set aside as holy. So as I pray, I'm going to open my arms available to him. I invite you to do the same, but more so than my, my hands, I'm going to open my heart, and I invite you to join me. Lord, we stand here as your people. We stand here as your tabernacle, your temple. Lord, we stand here as a consecrated place, which we understand that you've set us apart. You've called us out from the world, from the cultures around us, not that we don't engage with them or talk with them or love them, but that we will not be mixed up in the things that they worship, that we would be a people. When people see us, they say there's something different about those people. And Lord, as we consecrated, sanctified, set apart, allow you to dwell in us, we then will allow you to direct us. Lord, hide your word in our hearts just as they did in that ark. 
Cover it by your power, just as they did in the days of, no of Moses. God, I pray that you would use us and send us and direct us, that you would build us and, and strengthen us. God, may we be ones that go into the world around us as set out, called out, consecrated ones, set apart, that we would represent you, that the glory of God would be evident in our lives, that we would be that temple of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, we understand that this is simply a type, a pattern of something that's already in heaven. So God, I don't know if we can humanly even understand eternity, but God, you've already given us the inheritance of eternity, and for that we're thankful. So Lord, may we live our lives as separate, called out ones, holy, sanctified, but ones that are sent to represent you in the world around us. Father, use us. Use this church. Use this gathering. Use our lives. And may we give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 And the church said, Amen. 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 Go out there as consecrated, holy unto God. God bless you.